Uh, and see you on the other side. Hello, friends, and thanks for staying until the last session of Phosphor G. I knew Malena, and she wanted me to do something special and give a session, talk about why are we doing free software, and a bit about family, and something different. And I want to thank you, the organizing committee of the Phosphor G, for letting me honor that wish. So let's talk about family. Uh, this is my father. And uh, my father was a honest man of simple tastes and he managed to raise a family of three brothers with a job in uh, in a market. He had a market so literally. But I want to talk especially about one moment, one interaction or rather a lack of interaction that defined my life. That is when uh, this happened when I was 19 or 20 years old and uh, I had my driving license. I had a car and yes, that's the car, that's the junker. I looked like an idiot because that's me from 20 years ago. But something changes when you have the freedom of having a car whenever you want. And this lack of interaction I had with my father was the day I didn't ask for permission to take the car. This is a decision I took based on responsibility. I knew or I felt secure enough or safe enough that my father was okay with this decision, so I took the decision with, without telling. Now, we have a word for that, at least we Spaniards do, which is emancipation. We use that word to denote when a minor of age goes and becomes independent from the, from the parents. I'm aware that that word can be charged in some cultures, especially if you're from the US, uh, emancipation has a direct link with the civil war, with the declaration of emancipation where slavery was de jure abolished. So let me be clear, I'm going to tackle political issues here. I don't think that we in Force for You should shy away from them. But to understand what I mean from uh, uh, what I mean by political, I would like to refer to a good book here from Javier de la Cueva, which uh, this is the uh, Cyber Activist Manual Theory and Practice of Micropolitical Actions. And one of the chapters does a, does a very good uh, overview of what politics are. In this book, Javier de la Cueva makes a very good summary of another summary of what we understand by politics. So, let me see. <clears throat> se llan, señala Norberto Bobbio que actualmente el término se emplea normalmente para referirse a la actividad o conjunto de actividades que de alguna forma tienen como punto de referencia a la polis, es decir, al Estado. El concepto de política ha tenido diferentes significados a lo largo del tiempo, que dependía del momento ideal de comunidad perseguida. Then Javier goes on to explain uh, the concept of Marx, uh, Weber, Carl Smith. Uh, Carl Smith is quite interesting because uh, makes dichotomies between uh, categories. Uh, en lo moral son las categorías del bien y el mal. En la estética se trata de lo bello y de lo feo. En lo económico, las categorías son lo beneficioso y lo perjudicial. En lo político, concluye Smith, las categorías son las de amigo y enemigo. Then Hannah Arendt, about how uh, any interaction between a lot of people makes, is inherently political. And John Rawls, also, about uh, political liberalism. In short, uh, politics is how a society is shaped, how a group of people bigger than the, what can be considered a tribe handles its affairs and how do we want it to handle its affairs. Now, emancipation obviously plays a big role in politics. It's inherently political. 
And uh, in free software, uh, emancipation has a very specific meaning when we remember about Stallman. The whole reason we have Stallman uh, spearheading the free software movement is because he wanted to emancipate from a printer. He was an adult person who knows about computers and wanted to have responsibility over his printer. That's why we have it. Now the concept of the concept of emancipation is also very political because we have things like Lenin and that's Lenin from Leninism who played a role in uh, women's right. This is uh, emancipation of women and obviously we're going to go into communism. Now I want to make a warning here or a, just so you are aware when I'm talking about communism I'm not talking about state author authoritarian interventionism. I am talking about the theoretical model of economical Marxism. I'm not meaning authoritarian interventionism. I want to make that clear because the term communism has been demonized and is kind of taboo to speak about it. So, so let me go over the part of the Communist Manifesto that talks about private property because that's the part that has been demonized the most, in my opinion. Let's see here. The theoretical conclusions of the communists are in no way based on ideas or principles that have been invented or discovered by this or that would-be universal reformer. They merely express, in general terms, actual relationships springing from an existing class struggle, from a historical movement going on under our very eyes. The abolition of existing property relations is not at all a distinctive feature of communism. All property relations in the past have continually been subject to historical change consequent upon the change in historical conditions. The distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But modern bourgeois private property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms, on the exploitation of the many by the few. In this sense, the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. We communists have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right of personally acquiring property as the fruit of a man's own labor, which property is alleged to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity and independence. Hard-won, self-acquired, self self-earned property. Do you mean the property of the petty artisan and of the small peasant, a form of property that preceded the bourgeois form? There is no need to abolish that. The development of industry has to a great extent already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean more than bourgeois private property? But does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital, i.e. that kind of property which exploits wage labor and which cannot increase except upon condition of begetting a new supply of wage labor for fresh exploitation. Property, in its present form, is based on the antagonism of capital and wage labor. Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. To be a capitalist is to have not only a purely personal, but a social status in production. Capital is a collective product, and only by the united action of many members, nay, in the last resort, only by the united action of all members of society can it be set in motion. Capital is, therefore, not a personal, it is a social power. When, therefore, capital is converted into common property, into the property of all members of society, Personal property is not thereby transformed into social property. It is only the social character of the property that is changed. It loses its class character. You are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. But in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine-tenths. You reproach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence 
is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so, this is just what we intend. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. Now, it is also important to remember that the theoretical Marxism is not about the destruction of property per se, but the destruction of the social relationships that this inequality in the amount of property or the accumulation of capital creates. Uh, it's weird to understand, or it's a bit shocking to try and understand this from a modern point of view, because we speak about freedoms and we have this idea seared in our, mind, in our minds that communism does away with freedom. Now, I am reading a Spanish translation of El Das Capital, and in this translation, the uh, uh, the reviewer, the, per the people writing the prologue, makes a very, very compelling argument about the concept of freedom. Marx establece dos condiciones para que el trabajo asalariado se generalice. La libertad jurídica individual, por, su posición, por oposición a las relaciones de dependencia personal típicas de las sociedades tradicionales, y la falta de control de los medios de producción, cuya propiedad está concentrada en manos de la clase capitalista. La combinación de autonomía individual y expropiación de los medios de producción hace que una gran cantidad de personas se vean materialmente obligadas a vender su fuerza de trabajo en condiciones formalmente libres. Esto es, no a causa de alguna clase de lealtad, reciprocidad o sometimiento institucionalizado, sino en el curso de una transacción jurídicamente voluntaria. Now, I do, I do agree that the accumulation of capital creates a form of oppression, a form in which one group of people can establish a form of oppression against a different group of people, which is exactly what Marx speaks about. Now, I don't want to be catalogued as, as a person that only reads one part of the argument or one side of the argument. That's why I have also been reading The, uh, the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Something that shocked me from reading Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, is that both Marx and Smith speak about the same things, really, or they share several concepts, which has been quite a surprise for me, actually. So let me go about a few of them, starting with the nature of wealth. The whole annual produce of the land and labor of every country, or what comes to be the same thing, the whole price of that annual produce, naturally divides itself, it has been observed, into three parts, the rent of the land, the wages of labor, and the profits of stock, and constitute a revenue to three different orders of people, to those who live by rent, to those who live by wages, and to those who live by profit. So one of the things that Smith does in this book is splitting the whole population in three different groups, land, uh, landlords, workers, and then profiteers, people that make money by selling high and buying low. And the thing is that for Smith, this is a natural thing to do in civilized societies that is apparently just good. And this class distinction is very, very obvious in some other parts of the book. We rarely hear, it has been said, of the combinations of masters, though frequently of those of workmen. But whoever imagines upon this account that masters rarely combine is as ignorant of the world as of the subject. Masters are always and everywhere in a sort of tacit but constant and uniform combination 
not to raise the wages of labor above their, their actual rate. To violate this combination is everywhere a most unpopular action and a sort of reproach to a master among its, his neighbors and equals. We seldom indeed hear of this combination because it is the usual and one may say the natural state of things, which nobody ever hears of. Masters, too, sometimes enter into particular combinations to sink the wages of labor even below this rate. These are always conducted with the utmost silence and secrecy till the moment of execution, and when the workmen yield, as they sometimes do without resistance, though, severely, though severely felt by them, they are never heard of by other people. Such combinations, however, are frequently resisted by a contrary defensive combination of the workmen, who sometimes, too, without any provocation of this kind, combine, on their, of their own accord, to raise the price of their labor. The masters, upon these occasions, are just as clamorous upon the other side, and never cease to call aloud the assistance of the civil magistrate and the rigorous execution of those laws which have been enacted with so much severity against the combinations of servants, laborers, and journeymen. The workmen, accordingly, very seldom derive any advantage from the violence of these tumultuous combinations. <clears throat> this is a bit striking. Somehow it's okay for people in power to reduce the wages of workers, but it, somehow it's bad for workers to unionize and try to raise their wages. It's just weird. The weirdness doesn't end here, though. But though in disputes with their workmen, masters must generally have the advantage, there is, however, a certain rate below which it seems impossible to reduce for any considerable time the ordinary wages even of the lowest species of labor. A man must always live by his work, and his wages must at least be sufficient to maintain him. They must even, upon most occasions, be somewhat more, otherwise it would be impossible for him to bring up a family, and the race of such workmen could not last beyond the first generation. Mr. Cantillon seems, upon this account, to suppose that the lowest species of common laborers must everywhere earn at least the double their maintenance. So not only it seems that workers will be earning less and less money each time, there seems to be a lower limit to this, which is double their maintenance. Now, the next part I'm going to read is hard. This is something hard and it's going to make you cringe most probably. So be advised. The labor of an able-bodied slave, the same author adds, is computed to be worth double his maintenance and that of the meanest laborer, he thinks, cannot be worth less than that of an able-bodied slave. So not only it's, it's just a law of nature that workers are going to have lower and lower wages, the limit is compared with a slave. And I do have a problem with casual acknowledgement of slavery, to be honest. So I do have a problem with this. I'm sorry. I cannot help it. My ethical standards just make me refuse this thing. And by that, I mean... This, this is the most basic set of ethical guidelines that I live by and I think everybody should live by. This includes items that I think all of us are aware of and agree on, such as uh, all human beings are born free, everybody is equal regardless of race, color, sex, language, religion, opinion, social origin, property, etc. Everybody has the right to life. Uh, no one shall be hanged in slavery. No one shall be subjected to torture. Everyone has the right to be recognized uh, against the law. 
the right of freedom of movement, the right to asylum, the right to nationality, etc., etc. There are a few more obscure or less well-known articles, uh, including the right to rest and leisure, and the right to a standard of living adequate to the health and well-being of himself and his family, and the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in the scientific advancements. Mostly what I want to say is that anything that is okay with slavery, even if in a casual way, is just wrong by modern standards. Maybe Adam Smith's opinion was okay in the context of 17th century Britain, it's certainly not okay in modern times. Also, if we are to set a dichotomy between these two ideologies, one which is rich people are going to get richer, poor people are going to get poorer, and that's okay and should be encouraged because that's the sign of a civilized society. And the other being rich people is going to get richer and poor people is going to get poorer. And that's awful because that creates human suffering. If we have that dichotomy, I have to side with this is awful. So that's why I don't think Adam Smith's point of view is ethical, which is different than valid. I want to roll back a bit and go over one of the main points of both Smith's and Marx's theories, which is industrial machinery. We have to keep in mind that both Smith and Marx are people who lived around or shortly after the Industrial Revolution, and the main point of industrial revolution is industrial machinery. The concept of machinery basically changed the whole landscape of production and society. Now, both of them have different approaches to this. The capitalist approach is that we have to let rich people be rich so they can make investments in big heavy machines and those big heavy machines would make an effect efficient way of making new products. Uh, on the other hand, Marx uh, has the opinion that machines are a form of oppression, this oppression that is not explicit. Nobody is going to help somebody at gunpoint and say, hey, work for minimum wage in this coal mine or else. No, the decision is, hey, you can either work for an awful wage in this coal mine or you can starve to death. So people are going to, you know, go and accept this kind of implicit oppression. Some other different way of looking at industrial machinery is uh, the job market. By this I mean that a job position uh, can be thought as a commodity. This is not something that in uh, Smith nor Marx works with explicitly, but it's a model that is perfectly compatible with. With this I mean that we can assume that a worker actually gets paid the full amount of his or her work and then has to pay the owner of the machine the cost of the, the job cost. Now, since the machine owner owns the machine and can control who can work with the machine, that creates a scarcity in the supply of jobs. And that scarcity on supply leads to a natural oligopoly or monopoly on jobs. Uh, Smith actually treats the issue of monopolies, so I'm going to go ahead and see what's, what he has to say about that. A monopoly granted either to an individual or to a trading company has the same effect as a secret in trade or manufacturers. The monopolists, by keeping the market constantly understocked by never fully supplying the effectual demand, sell their commodities much above their natural price and raise their emoluments, whether they consist in wages or profit, greatly above their natural rate. 
the price of monopoly is upon every occasion the highest which can be got. The natural price, or the price of free competition, on the contrary, is the lowest which can be taken. Now, something that neither Smith or Marx or any of the classical economists could ever take into account was the possibility of a machine which could be gratuitously copied or in other words there could be an infinite supply of machines this is something that has only been enabled by information technology we know that copying software or copying data has a negligible cost in most cases unless we're talking about big uh, uh, big data or terabytes and terabytes of satellite imagery etc but for software even the heaviest pieces of software can be copied for negligible cost. This is in contrast to the need of make a big investment to set up a machine. So if we could go back in time and ask classical economists, hey, what could happen if we could copy some industrial machine, say a loom or a steel mill? What if you didn't need a big investment to set an industry? To set up an industry and start working with that. The, this monopoly on job posts would disappear and there would be infinite supply and then this whole the price has to go as high as possible because it's a monopoly that would go away. Now Smith has a uh, one more item that I would like to read which is what happens with trade secrets. If something is known by everybody, if a technique is known by everybody, what happens to this apart monopoly? The same increase of competition would, re would reduce the profits of the masters as well as, as the wages of workmen. The trades, the crafts, the mysteries would all be losers, but the public would be a gainer. The work of all artificers coming in this way much cheaper to market. I find this contradictory in, uh, in Smith's theory. On one hand, it seems that the wealth of nations is the sum of the price of everything, but in some, under some other point of view, to have something cheaper is good. So I'm not sure which is, which is the right approach and whether we choose one approach or the other to be best, if, uh, which is to say the sum of the prices of everything has to be higher or the sum of the prices of everything has to be lower, that is a purely political choice. It's, it, there's no moral right or wrong. It's do we want the monopolies of the producers to be held so they can have a higher price or do we want the price of everything to go down so everybody can share into the benefits of this now this <clears throat> sorry this is as i said a purely political choice in my opinion and i think that rich people or people who already control resources want to commodify and further exploit and monopoly, monopolize these commodities and poor people or people with no such big resources want to decommodify this means of production so they can share into those advantages this is what creates these relationships of power the ability to commodify or not commo or decommodify has a direct impact on uh, who has power over who. These relationships have a modern referent in Lawrence Lessig for culture. Lawrence Lessig is one of the main persons behind the Creative Commons licenses, which we should all be uh, acquainted with. In his book from 2005, he speaks about mostly about media as in books, movies and music and how this creates relationships of power. 
Uh, speaking about a meeting that took place, place in uh, 2003 in the World Intellectual Property Organization. What was surprising was the United States government's reason for opposing the meeting. Again, as reported by Krim, uh, Jonathan Krim of the Washington Post, as reported by Krim, Lois Boland, acting director of international relations for the US Patent and Trademark Office, explained that open source software runs counter to the mission of WIPO, which is to promote intellectual property rights. She is quoted as saying, to hold a meeting which has as its purpose to disclaim or waive such rights seems to us to be contrary to the walls of WIPO. These statements are astonishing on a number of levels. First, they are just flat wrong. As I have described, most open source and free software relies fundamentally upon the intellectual property right called copyright. Without it, restrictions imposed by those licenses wouldn't work. Thus, to say it runs counter to the mission of promoting intellectual property rights reveals an extraordinary gap in understanding, the sort of mistake that it's excusable for a first law student but an embarrassment from a high government official dealing with intellectual property issues. When Ms. Bolin says that there is something wrong with a meeting which has as its purpose to disclaim or waive such rights, end quote, she is saying that WIPO has an interest in interfering with the choices of the individuals who own intellectual property rights, that somehow WIPO's objective should be to stop an individual from waiving or disclaiming an intellectual property right, that the interest of WIPO is not that intellectual property rights be maximized, but that they also should be exercised in the most extreme and restrictive way possible. There is a history of just, of just such a property system that is well known in the Anglo-American tradition. It is called feudalism. Under feudalism, not only was property held by a relatively small number of individuals and entities, and not only were the rights that ran with that property powerful and extensive, but the feudal system had a strong interest in assuring that property holders within that system not weaken feudalism by liberating people or property within their control to the free market. Feudalism dependent, uh, depended upon maximum control and concentration, it fought any freedom that might interfere with that control. As Peter Drahos and John Braithwaite relate, this is precisely the choice we are now making about intellectual property. We will have an information society. That much is certain. Our only choice now is whether that information society will be free or feudal. The trend is towards the feudal. The danger in media concentration comes not from the concentration, but instead from the feudalism that this concentration, tied to the change in copyright, produces. It is not just that there are few powerful companies that control an ever-expanding slice of the media. It is that this concentration can call upon an equally bloated range of rights, property rights of a historically extreme form that makes their business bad. Now, the access to both arts and sciences is something that is covered by the Human Rights Declaration. So I want to go back to it, to the relevant part, because this is really relevant right now. So, Article 27. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which they are author. This provides a bit of a conundrum. On one hand, we want to protect the moral and material rights of authors. And on the other side, it is a human right to have access to the arts and sciences. Now, 
we have set over the centuries a system for trying to protect this, which is intellectual property and patents. How this is supposed to work is the following. Somebody makes an invention or writes a book or creates a piece of art or creates a piece of knowledge. That author gets a right. That right, a copyright, makes the, uh, the work scarce. By enforcing that scarcity, the price of that work can be raised. And by raising that price, the author can get more money. And ideally, when the author gets more money because their work is better, that author will have an incentive to produce more things. So, the author gets a copyright, which is a kind of property. That author can enforce a monopoly. The price rises. The author gets more money. The author does more work. This is a direct uh, implementation of some of Smith's ideas or theories about how price is built. If we go back to Smith, we will remember that price has three components, which is the rent of the land, the wages of labor, and the profits of stock. Now, when somebody has a copyright or a patent, that enforces a scarcity, and that scarcity creates a profit. So it's something a bit weird because the author of an intellectual work does not make any work per se. They don't make a physical thing that has increased value. Instead, they make something that is then made scarce to raise the price. But there's a big contradiction here, because technological advancements have a globally negative price. This is something hard to grasp, so I will try to explain this. <clears throat> you see, the act of doing work is to add value to something. So when, when we change a manual labor into an industrialist labor or a better process, we make the amount of work needed for the same value to be lower. The important thing here is not the price or the value, but to have a clear understanding of what these concepts mean. The classical concepts are that value is something that um, allows a human to fulfill a need in some abstract way, and the price is the amount of work or the toil, of, uh, the toil and trouble that a human has to go through to reach that value. So work does create value, but gatekeeping and producing scarcity does not create value. It only increases the price, which is one of the reasons why I think that the old theories about maximizing price or national gross product are not the best way to quantify how much value is created. All this thing can be perverted. The traditional way of, en of encouraging the advancements of sciences is by creating scarcity. Now, since we have a framework for creating scarcity, the way to pervert this is to create scarcity out of something that is not really a scientific advancement. You can create scarcity of something and then create a need for that something and then raise the price, get a monopoly and get profit from it and get money from it. And unfortunately, this is what's happening on the intellectual property front. We are creating artificial scarcity of things that have no reason to be scarce, especially when the authors and the scientific authors are not getting any advancement of it. I also want to go through 
some of the part of Lessig's book referring to intellectual property. Because I do think that none of the classical authors of economic tests and none of the lawmakers that lived centuries ago, because let's be clear, intellectual property laws were not made in the 21st century, they could not imagine how this could end up. Let me quote Lessig. This is perhaps the central claim of this book. So let me make this very slowly, let me take this very slowly so that the point is not easily missed. My claim is that the internet should at least force us to rethink the conditions under which the law of copyright automatically applies because it is clear that the current reach of copyright was never contemplated much less chosen by the legislators who enacted copyright law. I think this rings very true today. We are supposed to have a human right to participate in the advancements of science, but because closing down the advancements of science is profitable, the way that everything ends up is we don't have access to the advancements of science. We don't have access to scientific papers. On that regard, I will make a claim which might sound extreme, but scientific journals and companies profiting from scientific journals such as Elsevier are arguably violating human rights. And arguably, Alexandra Elbakian the main person behind Sayahav, arguably she is a hero of human rights. Human rights can impact our understanding of copyright. So I'm going to go ahead and read some parts of this paper that was presented in 1999 in the World International Property Organization. This is a paper by Audrey Chapman, PhD, Director of Science and Human Rights Program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, D.C. This is a human rights perspective on intellectual property, scientific progress, and access to the benefits of science. What then does this mean for interpreting the right benefit from scientific advances? It certainly imposes a different standard from the current tendency to favor the interests of large corporations or to promote the abstract principle of scientific competitiveness. A human rights approach establishes a requirement for the state to undertake a very rigorous and desegregated analysis of the likely impact of specific innovations as well as an evaluation of proposed changes in intellectual property paradigms, and to utilize these data to assure non-discrimination in the end result. When making choices and decisions, it calls for particular sensitivity to the effect on those groups whose welfare tends to be absent from the calculus of decision-making about intellectual property, the poor, the disadvantaged, racial, ethnic, and linguistic minorities, women, rural residents. Consequently, in undertaking these determinations, the status of the middle class, the comforts that are likely to accrue to the affluent or the potential profits to investor, count to much less than improving the status of the vulnerable and bring them, them up to my mainstream standards. In the early 1980s, C.G. Wiramantri wrote a book entitled The Slumbering Sentinels, which examines the implications of unfettered technological advance. All, uh, Wiramantri advocated the need to undertake broad reforms to rearrange the political process so as to assure that science and technology policy not be dictated from the top or shaped by a few powerful interests. But this has not taken place. Instead, the rapid development of science and technology and the pressures imposed by economic globalization have shifted the balance even further away from citizens' control. 
a recent paper written by the Center for Inter International Environmental Law describes the situation with regard to the formulation of intellectual property law as follows. Intellectual property laws are defined through closed, secretive international negoci negotiations dominated by industry and are then brought to national legislatures as fate, fate's accomplice without democratic deliberation. Combined with the technical, arcane nature of intellectual property legal specialty, this has helped corporate interests to avoid public scrutiny and expand their control over developments in applications such as electronic information, biotechnology or pharmaceuticals. Industrial country governments promote corporate interests in expanded intellectual property rights in the name of maximizing native national competitiveness in a global marketplace. According to some analysts, Albert Mormon among them, modern technology encourages us to treat an expanding range of human relationships as well as things, as commodities whose utility we measure and consume. Others, such as I am Barber, recognize the subtle danger of extending technological attitudes to all of life until human beings and other creatures are treated as objects to be exploited. Barber points out that technologies frequently bring an inequitable distribution of costs and benefits. One group benefits, while other groups bear the brunt of the risks, risks and indirect costs. According to Barbour, technology, which is both a product and an instrument of social power, also tends to reinforce the concentration of wealth and political power in existing social structures. All of this is to say one thing, is to say what free, libre, open source software is not about. Free, libre, open source software is not about community, it is not about gratuity. Free, libre, open source software is not about, hey, I'm just going to put this code on GitHub and I'm done, I have done the good open source thing, which is fashionable today. It's not about making more efficient software. It's not about making faster software. It's not about making cheaper software. Free, libre, open source software has always been about relationships of power and about subverting the relationships of power that historically have benefited the rich and powerful in favor of those who are not rich and powerful. This is about allowing people to emancipate and take responsibility of the software. Free, libre and open source software has more in common with the right to repair movement that has taken ground recently. Uh, it has been made famous by car manufacturers who are closing down on the firmware of cars and saying that the firmware and software in the cars is property and not the property of the car user. So free, libre and open source software is about taking control of your own software, of the software running in your computer and your things from a place of responsibility. It's not freedom from a place of I'm going to, go to get gratis support from maintainers. It's not. It's about I'm going to get free of the current maintainers because they are going to hold no power over me. If some software is not able to do that because it's too complex or because it has dependencies or there are social structures that make emancipating that piece of software costly or cumbersome, then that is not really free software according to my definition of emancipation. Only, for, only software that you can take control of from a place of responsibility can be free software. Now, I know that there is also the libertarian point of view, which is just complete deregulation of intellectual property. They have good points, but as I think I have covered already, in all my reading, 
The deregulation will only increase the class struggles and the existing relationships of power. I do think that the ethical way forward and the human rights approach is to allow emancipation of software, is to allow people to emancipate from the makers of the software and take control and responsibility of their software. Historically, free liberal open source software has been defined in two main groups. Again, I'm going to make a dichotomy here. On one side, we had the GPL or viral or reciprocal or server-like software licenses. And on the other side, we have had the deregulated or MIT or BSD licenses, which are just waiving all rights possible. This dichotomy has kind of served as well and has prompted endless discussions. Now, I think that that discussion can be reformulated or reframed in terms of political points of view. One being the emancipative point of view, which enables people to take control of the software and this allows people from restricting that software. In other words, it keeps reaffirming the right to emancipate and take responsibility. On the other hand, we will have the deregulated, or in my words, neoliberal. I say neoliberal in the terms of deregulation kinds of software licenses. So instead of GPL and MIT BSD, I would prefer to speak in terms of emancipative and neoliberal software licenses. Now, I think it's time to end up re-paraphrasing -para the manifesto. So let me take this again and do something to it. Let me take and rephrase the Communist Manifesto in terms of software emancipation. In this sense, the theory of the techno-communists may be summed up in the Silgan sentence, abolition of intellectual property. We techno-communists have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right to personally securing intellectual property as the fruit of a person's own labor and thought, which property is alleged to be the sole incentive for the advancement, the advancement of the sciences. Hard-won, self-authored, self-earned intellectual property. Do you mean the property of the scholar and the writer and the artist, a form of authorship that preceded copyright? There is no need to abolish that. The development of technological industry has to a great extent already, already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean modern corporate intellectual property? But does offering for a wage create any intellectual property for the worker? Not a bit. It creates scarcity, i.e. the kind of property which enables gatekeeping and which cannot increase except upon condition of getting a new supply of authorship for fresh exploitation. Intellectual property, in its present form, is based on the antagonism of gatekeeping and authorship. Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. To be a gatekeeper is to have not only a purely personal, but a social status in production. Gatekeeping by enforcing, law, by enforcing laws of scarcity is a collective effort and only by the united action of many members, nay, in the last resort, only by the united action of all members of society can it be set in motion. Gatekeeping is therefore not a personal, it is a social power. When therefore intellectual property is converted into common property, into the property of all members of society, scarcity is removed but authorship is not thereby transformed. It is only the social character of the intellectual property that is changed. It loses its class character. You are horrified at our intending to do away with intellectual property. But in our existing society, intellectual property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine-tenths. You reproach us, therefore, 
with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so. That is what we intend. Techno-communism deprives no person of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive them of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. And I would like to leave you with this thought. Thanks for being in Fosfogy.